Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Tyson. I'm a longtime reader and a fan of Wired, a big fan of Andy Greenberg, um, who I think does a lot of um, really interesting coverage um, relevant to perhaps some of the things I'll, I'll be chatting with about now. Um, I am a part of the founding team of the Web3 Foundation. It funds decentralized technologies, which include blockchains. Um, I'm also a core contributor to the NEAR protocol, uh, which you'll hear me very briefly mention later in this talk. Um, but this presentation is really designed to help describe a new way of thinking about the web, perhaps maybe less of like a fintech perspective and just a general idea of what a return to the original principles of the web looks like um, and how cryptocurrency can enable that. Uh, it's a web where um, you know, our data and our access to knowledge and human progress is not owned and manipulated by a few giant tech monopolies. And, it's a web where users are recognized as first class citizens, contributors, active builders, and in turn become owners. Um, but first, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we got here. And it all started with a white paper posted on the internet. In 2008, we all remember trust in our financial institutions and the governments that are meant to hold them accountable is done for. Small, weird white paper popped up in a very niche corner of the internet, a very technical idea of peer-to-peer -peer cash based on cryptographic principles. And it gets sent around a, a cypherpunk mailing list, uh, kind of, what do, we, what do we think? What do we want to do with this? I think the consensus generally clearly was, it seems ambitious, but it's worth a shot. Um, so by 2009, the first Genesis block of Bitcoin was mined. There's a nice little message I've, I've highlighted there for you with a, a simple immutable headline from uh, the Times with Chancellor on the brink of the second bailout. So it's quite clear that Bitcoin had a very different idea of money. It was peer to peer. So obviously no governments or third parties were involved. It was just you, some ones and some zeros. Um, and so these ones and zeros, they, they made Bitcoin very transparent. It allowed the owner of said Bitcoins to not just trust that Bitcoin, um, you know, was held by them and, and the network was working uh, as, as expected, but it allowed them to verify. And I think this is really important, as we'll see later in, the, in, in this presentation, um, to be able to verify that things are kind of working uh, as prescribed. I was also open source and censorship resistant. So as long as you could memorize a password, you would always have your Bitcoin. Uh, so it was really great because Bitcoin enabled us for the first time to be our own bank. Um, and it allowed us to eliminate the middleman, this trusted third party, and it launched the idea of an ownership economy. Meanwhile, though, in Silicon Valley, we're also seeing an explosion of uh, an idea of an ownership economy in a different way, right? So there was an explosion of social media in um, the mid 2000s uh, going into uh, you know, 2010 uh, as a way to democratize access to information, a way to empower consumers to become creators. I mean, these are actually very noble ideas. And uh, I got my start actually uh, at a marketing agency that became one of the first social media agencies. We were working with brands on creating these really innovative ideas like Facebook applications where we could, um, you know, tap into people's friends and, and kind of offer them suggestions based on their preferences. Um, you know, so in, in 2012, which is when this article from Wired was posted, um, you know, we started tracking users and uh, understanding what like data preferences they had and trying to target ads to them uh, to personalize their experience. Right. So we're we're giving them, um, you know, the, the Internet that they that they want based on the data. Um, but, you know, who could have who could have imagined right with with great data comes great responsibility, um, as probably GDPR would would you know make make quite clear to everyone who has to deal with with GDPR. Um, you need to be able to trust the platform that you are using, and that is the fundamental problem of our existing web and what we're trying to do differently. Because we now know that we can trust these platforms, right? We can trust them to follow their incentives. We can trust them to maximize our attention, to maximize their profit. We trust that they will 
lure us in, have us create and share and like, and then sell all of that to the highest bidder, uh, which, you know, is not only creepy, uh, but if you abstract away the creepiness, you'll also be reminded that, you know, people make up social networks, not companies, but the profit of that co-creation, of all that sharing, of all that posting, of all that liking, that profit goes to a small group of shareholders and not the hundreds of millions of contributors who are making that network what it is. So this brings us back to the current trust-based economy. Now, Bitcoin addressed in 2008 how we can take trust out of our money, how we can disintermediate money. But in 2020, we need to address how users of technology are trusting companies. So, yeah, sure. Like, I know everyone's like, trust, it's great, right? It sounds great in a brand values document alongside, like, reliable and friendly and innovative. Um, but we're suffering from a severe lack of trust these days. And I don't know about you, but I don't I, like I don't know how many more headlines or Netflix documentaries I need to see before like I just throw my phone in the ocean and go and start a hippie commune, uh, grow my own vegetables and just completely go offline. But like actually, while a hippie commune sounds really great, we don't need to give up on the web, right? The web provides us with access to information and progress, but what we do need is a new model. And that is a model that prioritizes truth. It's a model that kind of disintermediates and allows the users to verify that what they're contributing to is in their interest. And I will show you some examples of this new model in action. But first, I've got this very beautiful slide to show uh, how new structures are different from existing web structures because it's not just about surveillance, although that's what we hear about in, in all the headlines these days um, and data breaches, but um, also in existing corporate web structures, right? You have this very top-down transactional approach. At the top of it, a company is looking to make profit for its shareholders, period, right? In order to do this, they take all their useful ideas and technology things that could otherwise be given to people to advance their own knowledge or their own products or their own ecosystems. They box it up, they label it proprietary, and in startup parlance in Silicon Valley, they surround their company by a moat, right? This is a, an aspirational thing to have a moat around your company. And you protect this, this castle with a team of lawyers and brand managers and dragons and lava. And truthfully, I'm not sure what is scariest um, about those protectors. But, um, you know, in, in, in theory, right, if you're a business owner or a musician, even, um, this is all fine and dandy. If you trust these castle guards to let down the drawbridge every time you want to sell your goods at the marketplace, maybe DJ a really cool basement rave at the castle. Um, but what happens when they don't let you in, right? You are completely cut off from the market. You're cut off from your fans. You're cut off from all these really cool, warm and fuzzy social vibes that you've created with your friends, with your fans, and you're cut off from your income. So this is the real problem, right? It's not just about capitalizing on people's data. It's also about people are building businesses on top of these platforms that at any moment can revoke the right for these businesses to exist. But the new web is structured a little bit differently. First of all, there's no centralized corporate entity making decisions, no CEO or board of directors to decide upon uh, the direction uh, of, of the company. These are protocols and they are powered by cryptocurrency which transitions the power of decision making from a company to the user. So because blockchains are permissionless and open source, holders of cryptocurrency can build on top of the protocol, they can suggest changes to the protocol, they can create new products and entirely new economies for that matter. So let's explore an example. Uh, well, okay, so while nothing 
Uh, well, Bitcoin's market cap is nothing compared to traditional markets. I mean, the, the speakers on this panel, um, this is probably like a rounding error for many of their companies. But uh, I think what's notable here is uh, within 10 years, right, Bitcoin is pushing a $200 billion market cap. And when it started in 2009, the earliest, uh, the, 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 the pricing was like fractions of a penny. So about a $10,000 market cap. Um, so its trajectory in 10 years into public consciousness is what's extremely notable. So everyone's heard about Bitcoin right now, right? Um, not to mention it spawned an explosion of new projects, new industries, new companies. Um, but most importantly, for the purpose of this talk, it also provides a current model of how we plan to redistribute ownership of the web. And this is how we got there. And I would like to note the intentional use of we here. There is no Bitcoin corporation, right? There are no marketing budgets. There's no product roadmap. There's no legal teams to enforce intellectual property and sue you if you uh, break copyright. Um, you know, this is, this is really kind of a, a different model. Um, and Bitcoin enabled a really robust ecosystem purely on the basis of being community owned because if you owned any fraction of a Bitcoin, you felt compelled to contribute, whether by creating infrastructure, like building simple wallets, hosting conferences, or simply telling your friends. So Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency that was owned, right, by anyone, allowed us to reimagine new paradigms. But it is just the start. And I'd like to dispel a little bit of the misnomer of cryptocurrency, because I think a lot of folks think, oh, cryptocurrency, you know, like, uh, so most protocols don't want to replace fiat, right? They don't even really want to replace Bitcoin. We love Bitcoin. Uh, we think it's, it's, it's quite great. Uh, but cryptocurrency enables participation in a network. So it enables us to experiment with new ways of human cooperation, and it allows us to co-create a future together. So it's not a proper talk on crypto until you see a super nerdy graph. Uh, and there's like literally nothing you need to remember from here other than to realize that there's all this technical infrastructure work that's being done over the past 10 years to support, well, I mean, deeper than 10 years, but specifically more to blockchains over the past 10 years uh, in peer-to-peer -peer decentralized networks. So we're still working on these various layers, but we are starting to reach an inflection point. And that's one where the promise of decentralized protocols, which enable ownership of the web, can actually start to be delivered. And I'm going to touch briefly on the L1 and the L2 sections for just a moment, and then we can uh, talk about some non-infrastructure use cases. In our space, we refer to blockchains that support decentralized applications as layer one. And you've probably heard of some of these. Uh, there's obviously more. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, but, um, you know, Ethereum, Polkadot, Near Cosmos are some of these projects that are experimenting with different solutions to security, consensus, scalability, um, all the things that you would need to build a decentralized application on top of. And cryptocurrency is used here mostly at a developer level. So it's used for transacting on the network. It's used for securing the network. It's used for um, payments of services. So your mainstream user isn't typically interacting with these networks, but something built on top of it. Still, right, developers are users just of a different kind. They're lower down the stack, uh, as we would say. Um, and this is the last geeky graph, I promise, but uh, it's, you know, it, it's not, not a crypto presentation without uh, these, these really technical graphs. But um, decentralized storage networks are really cool. We're seeing an emergence of those which enable users to host encrypted files, non-encrypted files, user's choice um, outside of the cloud, right? So anyone can get paid to host these files and, and store them. Um, and they'll be uncensorable. There are several that are currently in use. So this is a super fun one. Um, and I think it's a beautiful example of decentralized protocols in the wild. I think a little bit closer to the, the FinTech uh, space. So uh, most of you probably know Coinbase, right? Obviously an exchange that allows people to have an on-ramp into crypto, probably your first interaction with Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Uh, it was started in 2012. 
um, by Fred Urson uh, and Brian Armstrong, and now has over uh, 1,100 employees. It's reportedly planning a proper IPO. Uh, I think the valuation is, I don't know, somewhere around like 8 billion or something. Um, but there is this explosion of innovation in the space right now called DeFi, uh, decentralized finance. And part of that is these decentralized ex exchanges, which um, are built on different protocols. Uniswap is one of them. So Uniswap was started in 2018, so just two years ago. Probably like, I don't know, like two, two people started it. Uh, it's a small group of core contributors. Um, and it's now achieving comparable trading volume to Coinbase, which has existed for, uh, you know, almost a decade now with 1,100 employees, God knows how many lawyers uh, and kind of, you know, regulatory um, interfaces they have. Um, and it has this comparable trading volume with significantly less overhead and investment. Um, and what's also really cool here, I mean, aside from the fact that you can build this like complete machine on top of a decentralized protocol without this corporate infrastructure um, is what they do with their tokens. So Uniswap recently gave tokens uh, to anybody who made a trade on the protocol, right? So if you did a trade, you got a Uniswap token. And this token will give them control over the fees the exchange charges, what those fees are spent for. Uh, they could be returned to token holders um, or used to build more products. So we're really also uh, decentralizing the governance, right, of uh, how these protocols are working. But I'd also like everyone to know that blockchain is starting to lose its its geeky niche roots. Um, artists, right, who have always moved into spaces that have been overlooked or tossed aside are making a home in this new web. And they are tired of record labels and music apps and galleries and big brands exploiting their culture. And they're seeking to create their own methods of ownership and collaboration. So there are numerous visual artists, musicians, uh, what we're calling new wave memologists, uh, people who are experimenting with crypto as a means to track provenance and value. So there are a number of these marketplaces that are popping up. Um, some are imagining a stock exchange for culture. So you can contribute to your favorite emerging artist to not only act as a patron, but also as a stakeholder, a shareholder in their future success. So, um, you know, you, there's always like that guy who discovered that band very early on and likes to talk about how early they were. But now you'll actually have like a, a dated timestamp of when you discovered that artist uh, and when you started supporting them. So, uh, you know, that's that I think is worthy in and of itself. Um, and also, you know, right on cue, where the artists go, the so does the old money. And in this instance, the old money is, uh, you know, more more of the social media, uh, so kind of newish. Um, but you know, some of them have actually been really thinking about this new paradigm. And you know, Reddit wants to give users ownership stake over their contributions to subreddit. So cryptocurrency tokens can be used to pay for membership to certain reddits, uh, subreddits, they can be used for tipping, they can be used for badges. And Twitter really doesn't want to moderate content, right? They are, they're really trying hard not to moderate content, but they're being thrown um, into, into doing that. They do care about responsible curation, uh, but they think there's a slippery slope for free speech. So they're betting that decentralized protocols can solve for this by ensuring that all content is published on the protocol and is filtered by products of which Twitter could become a product of a decentralized protocol. At least that's how Jack Dorsey sort of frames it right now. And Facebook, well, you know, they just want to replace the dollar with a Facebook dollar. So Facebook's just going to do Facebook. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I think the key takeaway here um, is to understand that in this new web, in this new paradigm, what we are looking at, right, uh, is not cryptocurrency as a means to replace like the dollar or the euro. It's finding ways to incentivize users to become contributors and giving them ownership stake in the crypto networks that they're participating in so that we're no longer kind of in this uh, existing landscape of, um, you know, dealing with 
uh, you know, multi multinational um, monopolies. Um, and, you know, we're actually having ownership and control over our own future. So thank you so much. <laughs>